So, dear brothers and sisters, you're very welcome to our Mass today and to this great Feast of Pentecost. Uh, it can be very often the case that the Holy Spirit is misunderstood as regards the various people or persons in the Trinity. Um, Jesus is probably the easiest to understand because he was more or less like us, at least he had a human body, he ate, he drank, he slept, uh, he was mortal. Uh, God the Father doesn't have a human body. So God the Father is pure spirit. So it's a little harder to imagine what God the Father is like. Maybe we, we imagine him as the old guy with the white beard, kind of like a dislocated Santa Claus uh, with Birkenstocks and a white alb or something. Uh, that's how we kind of picture him, or that's how traditionally we see him in movies or you know, cartoons. Uh, but it's, 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 it's hard to get your head around God the Father, uh, even though, as I say, he cons consistently and constantly reveals himself as Father, it's difficult for us not to imagine that. Equally, the Holy Spirit, I think, is difficult for us to have a relationship with because you think, well, spirit, a spirit is like, like a ghost or how does it work? And often when we do confirmation retreats and you ask the kids, you know, so what's the Holy Spirit? Who's the Holy Spirit? There's always some really enthusiastic kid who shoots up the hand and says, sir, 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 sir. And I say, yes, my little friend, uh, who's the Holy Spirit? It's the bird or the dove. Uh, good attempt, um, but the Holy Spirit is not a bird. Okay, we have chickens out there, we have turkeys, we have geese, we have all sorts of animals out there, little fowl. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not one of them. Uh, right, the Holy Spirit is not a bird. Uh, there are symbols of the Holy Spirit. They represent the Holy Spirit. They remind us of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not a bird. Okay, so when it comes to, like, uh, to, to, to understanding the Holy Spirit, uh, we, have to try and, we have to try and simplify it without trying to reduce the mystery to something uh, too simple either. But the Holy Spirit ultimately is, and this, it's a simple definition, not the easiest to understand, but still simple, I think, is the personification of the love of God. So it's the love of God made into a person, not a human person, but a divine person. The Holy Spirit becomes a person. So that's why the Holy Spirit then proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is such a love between God the Father and God the Son. This love is so real, and so intense, and so divine, so eternal, that a third divine person proceeds from that love. So it's the personification of divine love. Similarly, like in, in, in a family, this, 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 this is why now when you do a marriage preparation course, hopefully this little slide will be part of it, but that the, the couple is called to participate in the inner life of the Trinity. The couple participates in the inner life of the Trinity. What on earth is that supposed to mean? Well, the husband loves the wife, the wife loves the husband. Their love is so great, so wonderful, that a, another person proceeds from that love. Another person comes from that love. That's, that's how every person should be conceived, out of love. They're, they're loved into existence. Okay, so, so the, the Holy Spirit then is this, this divine love, this divine love. So when, we, when we're asking then for the Holy Spirit, this is what we're asking for, for divine love, not just human love, not just kind of, you know, sound, you're, you know, he's a generous person, nice guy. No, divine love to live in me, to act through me, to bear fruit in my life. This is what we're asking for. So I think it, it, these, these occasions, like, like, like Pentecost, uh, like uh, Easter, like every Holy Mass, all of these liturgical occasions, they're very, very important for us. They, we, they, they're, they should be key moments of growth in our spiritual life. I was reading an article there during the week uh, about a guy named Ronnie Coleman. Now, he mightn't be so famous in Ireland and maybe not amongst your good selves. Ronnie Coleman uh, was uh, Mr. Olympia. Uh, champion from, from 98 to 2005. He is simply enormous. If you've ever seen Arnold Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger is like his little brother. Right? This guy is built like, a, he's like me. Right? <laughs> Actually, he's about as big as me when I'm wearing this. That's, that's, like, he's just got these mm, traps, just like a complete V. When he, when he flexes up, it's as my mom would say, he's like a Belgian blue for any of you farmers out there. Uh, just, just, just lumps of muscle everywhere, right? And then to win Mr. Olympia eight times, that's phenomenal. The guy is enormous, okay? But when he talks about what his life is like, or his life was like, 
during that time, like eight, eight times Mr. Olympia champion. Uh, all you do, all day, all you do, all day, is work towards this goal. So non-stop protein, non-stop workouts, non-stop hot cold treatment, non-stop surgeries, all right? So he won eight times, but because of all the working out, his back is now wrecked. His, his, the, his lower back is destroyed. All the, the discs and the cartilage is gone. It's just an absolute mess. So he was just describing how his most recent surgery was they had to... Had, they, <laughs> we, we have children present. They had to... They had to... They had to, go, they had to give him a little... <laughs> they had basically... <laughs> They had to access the inside of his spine, okay? Now, there are some organs in the way, right? They had to move those organs away. They had to take them out, work on the inside of the spine, and put all the organs back in, right? That's how, how like his back is absolutely wrecked. So, he's now 57 years of age, Mr. Mr. Olympia champion eight times, and crippled. Crippled. I can hardly walk. And just when you see the pictures of, you know, in his heyday, how he looked and how he looks now, that... What did he have like, to drive him, to drive him to those degrees of, of exercise and now pain? Like having to push through pain, like you know, having to just push through, and it, it hurts and hurts, but pose, look good, and I mean absolutely agonizing pain. What they had, what those kind of athletes have, or athletes in general who excel in their sport, what they have is an absolutely, undeniably strong desire to attain that goal. They have a desire to win. And that desire in them is so great that they will overcome anything, discomfort, sleepless nights, pain, surgeries, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to attain that goal. And when I think of, of, of us and our spiritual life, often I know we want to make things accessible and like Jesus makes himself so accessible, so easily accessible in, in Holy Communion. But I think we have to ask ourselves the question on occasion, you know, how great is my desire for any of these spiritual gifts that God is offering me? So this is Pentecost. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit coming down upon the apostles, uh, coming down upon this, this, the, the, the young church, this same Holy Spirit that you and I have received in baptism and confirmation. Do you even want him? Do you want the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I think most people say, yeah, sure, you yeah, can. suppose, yeah, great, yeah. Do you though? What if you had to do something for it? What if you had to actually sacrifice yourself or do something to attain this gift, to receive this gift? What would you do? What would you be willing to do? Oh, I, ha I have to do something, do I? Well, yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. What would you do? What would you be willing to do? You look at what people are willing to do to attain a medal or a trophy or a bit of water or crystal in the, on the shelf there somewhere for some award. What people are willing to do for mere human goals. What am I willing to do for spiritual goods? For spiritual treasures that never pass? What am I willing to do? The, the way often I think our, our faith has been presented to us, we don't actually have to do very much. And I suppose we're not used to actually having to do anything really. Uh, you just turn up for baptism. You just kind of do a quick marriage preparation course and turn up for that. You just turn up for mass. We don't, we don't tend to actually prepare for these things much at all. The danger then is while they're very accessible, they may be very devalued. Are they worth anything? Anything, anything worthwhile is worth preparing for. I'm in contact with two couples at the moment who are preparing their, their weddings, which are still six months away. But they're working on the seating arrangements and the pamphlets and new, what are they called, booklets and all of that. Make sure that the napkins match the bridesmaids' dresses. Do you know that women see 25% more color than men? So if they ask us, are these colors the same? We will practically always say, whatever you think, honey, it's all great to me. <laughs> anyway, so all of these, like anything worthwhile is worth preparing for. Do you want the gift of the Holy Spirit? Do you want the Spirit to be alive in your life? Do you want him? I think there are two key steps in order to actually allowing the Spirit to be alive and active in my life. If I say I want the Holy Spirit to be alive in me, but I'm never, ever, ever willing to pray, you're only codding yourself. For those who aren't Irish, you're only fooling yourself. Uh, is, that, is, is, is that a hint? <laughs> Subtle. Uh, 
it, for, for those who say they want the Holy Spirit but are never willing to pray, all right? Never willing to pray, then you don't really want the gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't. It's a nice idea, but you don't really want it. You don't really want it, you don't really get it. Okay. First thing is daily prayer. If prayer isn't daily, then you don't really want a life in the Spirit. Okay? If we're not praying, and, and, and real prayer, prayer, obviously, I, I, I should always explain what that means. Like prayer is, is this uniting of my heart to God's heart in whatever way, shape, or form that takes place. If it's, if it's in the silence of adoration, if it's in the Rosary, Divine Mercy Chapel, bravery, what, what, meditating scripture, whatever it may be, it's a union of hearts. That's what prayer is, not just I got the thing done, but I, I take time to unite my heart to the Lord's. If I, if, if, I, if I never take time for that, then I don't really want the Holy Spirit. Okay. The second reading, which we heard here, Galatians 5. Let me just find it. There we go. Gives us a key to, to, to life in the Spirit. It says, if you are guided by the Spirit, you will be in no danger of yielding to self-indulgence. Since self-indulgence is the opposite of the spirit. So that's, that's key number two. One is prayer. If I'm not uniting my heart to the Lord's, then I, I don't really want God. I don't really want the Holy Spirit. Secondly, self-sacrifice. I'm willing to renounce myself. If I'm not, the, spirit, the Holy Spirit will never be able to work in and through me. Why? Because if I'm never willing to sacrifice myself, it means ultimately my goal in everything I do is me, for my comfort, and my betterment, and my career, and my life, and my happiness, and me, 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 me. And as long as I'm doing that, I cannot live a life of love. Why? Because love always thinks of the good of the other. Love is focused on the other. Self-indulgence focuses on me. So if the Holy Spirit is the personification of love, then love is going to think of the other first. So as long as I'm stuck in my own little head of what I have to do to realize myself and you know, be me and be all I can be and me, 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 then I'm not focused on the other, which means the spirit is not, cannot work through me. So if we really want this gift, if I want a life of the, in, in the spirit, I must pray. I must pray. I must pray daily. I must unite my heart to the Lord's daily. And secondly, I, I must learn in the small, ordinary things of life to renounce myself. Otherwise, there's just, there's just no room. If I'm full of myself, I'm full of my own thoughts and plans and all this, then there's no room for the Spirit to act. The more I'm willing to renounce myself, the more room there is for the Spirit to work. And then we'll see lives and hearts transformed. In... In this book you may have seen, the Adoration, Cha in Adoration Chapels, is my, am, I, am I on my radio mic? I'll just switch over here for a sec. <coughs> in this book, in, in Sinu Yezu, I think I mentioned it uh, this time last year, there's a, a prophecy mentioned. And the author writes the following. Today the Lord spoke to me of a great sacerdotal Pentecost, so a priestly Pentecost, of a grace obtained by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary for all priests of the church. To all priests will be offered the grace of a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit to purify the priesthood of the impurities that have disfigured it and to restore to the priesthood a brightness of holiness such as the church has never had since the time of the apostles. Now, Again, just to, just to reflect on that. Remember the fear the apostles were in before Pentecost. Locked away for fear of the Jews. The Spirit comes down upon them, and then they go out with incredible boldness under the noses of those who just killed Jesus. And then they're warned not to preach in his name. They say, thanks very much. They do it anyway. They get flogged. They go back the following day to the same place under the noses of the same people who crucified Jesus. Phenomenal courage, selflessness, wisdom, eloquence in their preaching for, for uneducated men. Imagine that kind of outpouring of the Holy Spirit on priests today. Do you know where every priest that you go to is like a holy man of God? 
who loves his people, sacrifices himself for his people, uh, sets your heart on fire with love for, for his word, for the sacraments, all of that. Imagine how incredible that would be. Uh, in senior years, the book goes on. This priestly Pentecost is being prepared already in silence and in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. So this, this grace of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, starting, starting with the priest, but for everyone, there will, be a, there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on everyone. It's being prepared now in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. The priests who love Mary and who are faithful in praying the rosary will be the first ones to benefit from it. Their priesthood will be wonderfully renewed and they will be given an abundance of charisms to vanquish evil and heal those under the sway of the evil one. So I think there's a great time coming. I think there's a great renewal coming. It's being prepared now. It's being prepared in prayer. It's being prepared in, in, in adoration. And when this comes, our church will be renewed. But not through any great scheme or plan or uh, committee. It will be renewed by the love of God. It will be renewed by the Holy Spirit himself. And that begins today. In you and I. In our daily prayer. And in our daily sacrifices. To make room in our hearts for this incredible gift of love personified.